Okay, so you're going to start off with your uh, Rhino workspace. It probably doesn't look exactly like this. I've modified a little bit of my appearance. I'm dealing with a white background. You all probably have a grayish background, but that's not going to make a difference. Um, so to make sure we're all on the same page, we're just going to make sure our units are the same. Sometimes when you open files, it'll start off in decimal or some type of metric unit. And obviously that's going to make a difference on everything else that you do. So in order to check that, you're going to click file, properties, and then select units and make sure you're in feet. So units, feet, hit OK. And that should really be the extent of doing that. Um, I like to separate my tabs of having my layers up here and then my properties down there. I think it starts off again, like having your properties over there. So they're all kind of grouped into one. So you can actually like click, hold and drag your properties out. And then you can click, hold and drag them back to that area where you see that it creates this kind of blue division. And then you can just kind of grab that area to divide it. Um, I usually change the properties of certain objects. So that's why I like to have those right there next to each other. Um, but like I said, we're just going to start off with an extremely simple uh, surface for now and go through just those processes of how to start to extract parameters, how you can use those parameters to change geometry. So the first thing to create this rectangle, I'm going to hover over my uh, surface from three or four corner points. If I click on this little triangle at the bottom, I can open up the window and see my options. And I'm just going to choose the rectangle uh, plane from corner to corner. So I'm going to click that. It doesn't matter where you draw this. I'll just start in this very origin corner of zero. <gasps> I'm going to go out. Um, 500 by 400. So it's a 500 by 400 foot uh, surface. That way we have plenty of room and it's somewhat comparable to the um, point cloud model. So it should translate fairly well. So once you've drawn that, go ahead and open Grasshopper. So you just want to type in your command box up here, Grasshopper. It might take a second for you to load. I already have mine opened up, but I let's just file. Uh, I could do. So make sure you have that. Has everybody got Grasshopper up and running for the most part? OK, so the way Grasshopper works is it's you can build things from complete scratch um, in Grasshopper itself, or you can work off of a referenced um, object in Rhino. The reason I'm going, even though it's just like a simple form in geometry, um, it's good to, like, I, I want to show it this way because you guys are going to be doing this very similar process of referencing your Rhino mesh or surface from your point cloud into Grasshopper. So that way you understand how objects are being referenced instead of just building them from scratch. So in this case, I've drawn a surface, so I need to reference a surface. And so if I go to my very first tab here, so it should say params, and then 
this is the section. So this very first section is the area where you're going to go to if you ever need to reference something from Rhino into Grasshopper. So I'm going to select the geometry down here and I'm going to choose the surface uh, component. So these are all called components in Grasshopper. Uh, there's different lingo people use, whether it's components, batteries, whatever, it's all the same thing. Um, so I just call them components. So I'm going to use my surface component and you'll select it and then just click into your canvas space and you'll notice that it's orange. And that's just because it doesn't have any objects associated to it. So in order to do that, I'm going to right click my surface component and I'm going to scroll down here and say set one surface. So I'm going to select that. Now it's going to go away for a second and allow for you, allow for you to select your Rhino surface. So I'm just going to select my rectangle. Now you can see this is this light gray, which means it's working. And now you have this kind of clipping red reference of that exact shape. Um, I really don't need this Rhino geometry anymore. So I'm just going to select it and type hide. And now I just have a blank red rectangle. I hear a bit of chatter. Is everyone? Have I lost a lot of people already? Okay. okay. So let's just kind of go over that again. I'll literally just start from scratch. If I ever want to see that again, I'll type show. So again, in order to bring anything into Grasshopper, I need to go to my first section here of parameters. You can see geometry. So this is where you reference geometry. I'm going to select the surface component. So I have this component that's orange because nothing's being referenced in it. So I'm going to right click, say set one surface and select my surface. And if you have it selected, it's going to look green or highlighted. If it's not, it appears red. When it's gray, it means it's functioning. So like I said, I don't like to have those two things overlapping. So I'm just going to hide my surface. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Of course. So I mean, hopefully, there's not a lot of more issues with kind of just referencing those. So we're primarily just going to work and do everything from Grasshopper now, just like how you're going to get your surface from that point cloud and do all your analysis and parameters from Grasshopper. So similar to what I was talking about earlier, um, a lot of the things that we need to do for this is to start off with a grid of points because points are going to kind of be our tool for extracting the majority of our data. So the best way to actually create a series of points or a grid of points on this is to now go over to our surface tab. So if you kind of just, and I'll take my time over this, but I, I don't know how well you can see that, but that first one we looked at was parameters. This is the first tab that we use to kind of reference Rhino material with Grasshopper. There's a math tab where that's where you start to um, manipulate some of that, that numerical data. You have your sets tab, which is a way of how you start to 
separate parameters or separate data or organize it in a certain way. And then you start to get into, just like how in Rhino you have tools to create points, you have tools to create curves, and you have tools to create surfaces and meshes. Just like that in Grasshopper, you have your vector tab, which is primarily used to uh, deal with points. You have your curve tab to deal with curves, surfaces to deal with surfaces, meshes, and so on. And then you have these last two that deal with interacting, so um, intersections, uh, transformations, and then as you become more fluid and comfortable with Grasshopper, you start downloading a ridiculous amount of other plugins to help your modeling. So, yep, so there's things like Kangaroo, KUKA, like helps like connect a Xbox Connects. Um, so you can actually like do 3D scanning with the Connects, which is pretty cool. You have the Mosquito, you have Human, Firefly, G howl, which is like a wolf howling. So, yeah, that's okay. So what I was talking about earlier, you have like elk to deal with GIS data as well as meerkat to deal with uh, shape files from for GIS. So you can start to do pretty cool GIS mapping in Grasshopper as well. Okay, so let's get back to talk. So that's just again a understanding of how it's organized, very similar to how these tabs on Rhino are. So we have a surface here that we've referenced. So the first thing we need to do is actually um, start to manipulate the surface. So we go to our surface tab and the easiest way to generate a series of points is if we go over to our utility section. So you have your analysis part, which we'll get into later but it's essentially just like how you'd follow most orders of operations. You need the analysis to serve as your origin. Then you have the free form. So you actually start to create geometry from that. And then you have kind of these default geometries and then you have utilities, which are kind of a extension of things to do with that. So, in utilities, what I want to do in order to create a series of points is I'm going to divide the surface. So I'm going to go to utilities and I'm just going to select the very first one, which is divide surface. And so you should get, again, another orange component because nothing's plugged into it. And this is the first time where we're going to do that. So we're going to take our surface. You'll notice that these have these different input areas and then you have an output in your component and they start off with these initials some of you like this is just another kind of uh, 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 workstation thing sometimes these icons are displayed with an icon or these components are displayed with an icon instead of letters I like to just know what they're called instead of what they their icon looks like so in some cases, especially like when you see other people's scripts, they might have it look like this. So this uses the icon instead of the actual verbiage for those. So in order to change that, you just go up to display and say, or uh, turn off draw icons, and then it will actually have the words. I figured this is the easiest way because whatever I call the components, if you ever need to just find it um, on the spot, you can double click your canvas and do a quick search. So I could do uh, divide surface. Oops, I should learn how to spell. And you can see that if I start typing divide surface, I have my divide surface component that pops up. So when you, again, become more familiar with all the different names of the components, it's a lot easier to just double click your uh, screen and type it versus having to like try and find it sometimes. So then the last thing to know about these components is like I said, there's these letters that are um, on either end. 
if you're unclear of how a component works, it's always good to just kind of take your mouse and hover over it. So this first thing that it's looking for is a surface. Perfect, we have a surface component. You can even see that they have the matching icon. So here's that surface icon. And then you can see here, it also is looking for that same icon. So that's always a helpful thing because sometimes they don't have the same verbiage. Uh, an example of that is normals and vectors. Sometimes like they're literally the same thing. It's a direction. Sometimes it's asking for a normal. Sometimes your output is saying a vector. So that could be a little confusing sometimes of knowing like, it's asking for a normal, but I only have vectors. But if you look at the icon that it's asking for, that's usually the more universal um, reference. So always kind of hover over that when you're not familiar with what it's asking. So I'm gonna drag that into there. And now you immediately see that this is working. And now I have a series of points on this grid. This component defaults to dividing your surface into increments of 10. So you can see my U count is 10 and my V count is 10. I'm not completely clear as to why they do it this way, but your U count is essentially your X direction or your X values and your V count is your Y. So whenever you see U and V, it's um, another way of understanding how many points in the X direction, how many points in the Y direction. And so, like I said, that defaults it to 10. For this exercise, we want to make uh, those counts to be much higher. So the easiest way to do that is you can create a number slider. You can go to the process of finding a number slider, but then you have to like edit all of its range of values so it defaults to like 0.25 and 1 which isn't going to be very helpful for us we want very high values and the the thing that makes grasshopper parametric is using number sliders these are numbers that we can literally just click and drag um, a circle and have those values change so what i'm going to do is click double click your space, and if you just type and let's just type 50, Grasshopper knows that if you type in a number, it's gonna create a number slider. So if I just type 50 and hit enter, I immediately get the slider that starts at 50. But like I said, I can click, hold, and drag this to see all my different values. So 50 should be a good amount to start with. So I'm just gonna drag that into both my U count and my V count. And now I have a much denser grid of points. And obviously I can just click and drag that to really uh, add a bunch of points or I can make it even less. So this is like the first kind of example of giving it that parametric function. I dragged it into both of these just because it's easier to control the count in both directions. Um, if you ever want to disconnect something that's going into there, hold control on your keyboard and you'll see that the icon as I get near it turns red, meaning you're going to unconnect it. So I'm just going to say, you know what, I need a slider for that one. I'm just going to type 50 again and drag it into this one. I just think that's more work because now I have to deal with two sliders instead of one, but I can obviously change the density in either direction. So I can do a, a small number of lines with a lot of points or vice versa. But for the purposes of this, I'm just gonna use one slider but no, you have that ability. How did you delete that exercise? So I just select it and then I just hit delete on my keyboard. So, oh, so sometimes Mac's a little bit weird. I think you have to hold like shift delete or command delete. You have to like hold two. 
Are any of those working? Um, the other way is you right click it and just say, or you can select and go to edit and just hit delete. That's the other way. I don't know why Macs are so um, combative for this program, but they are. Even like when you're in boot camp or this, like I don't know why, like it's still. Oh, so yours might be it's either command or option or one of those. Alt. Yeah, it's one of those things where yeah, like it's enough just to frustrate you and be annoying. So, okay, so we've got our surface that's divided into a bunch of points. I really don't need this red rectangle anymore. So you can see when I select an object, it turns green. So right now my surface is green. If I select um, the divide components, you can see all my points are highlighted green. So that helps you understand like which ones are active and which ones are not. And I, like I said, I don't really need this rectangle anymore. So if I select my surface component, there's two ways you can do it. You can right click it and the first icon is to preview it. You can turn that off so you no longer have to see it. Another way to do it, which is a little bit quicker, if you just hit spacebar on your keyboard, you get this kind of wheel of icons. And it's just like with a lot of the Adobe programs, very similar, you have a person without an eye mask on, to preview it, I'll hit spacebar again to put that eye band on him so I don't see it. It's kind of weird, but it is what it is. Um, the other differences, like sometimes you'll have to disable a component. So this is just turning a component on or off. So just like how you have layers, you can turn them on or off. Sometimes you want to disable it because you might have to make a dramatic change. And then as these scripts become more and more uh, complex, it's just a lot of information that has to process if you change something at the start. So another thing to know I'll turn it back on so you can see it's still working. But if I want to do something else, I could also, I could either right click it again or I can hit space bar. And you have these two switches. This one means it's turned on, so the more bold looking. Then the one that's faded means disable it. So you can see now it becomes this kind of faded icon that's gray and everything that that's being inputted into turns either orange or red, meaning it's just not processing it. So just know that there's a difference between the two. Just because you turn it off doesn't mean it's not processing that data. You're just not looking at it. Okay, so let's try and get into the more fun stuff, I promise. Okay, so for this exercise, we're gonna do a simple proximity uh, manipulation or uh, parameters. So I'm just gonna draw one more thing in Rhino and that's going to be a single point. So I'm gonna go up to my top here in Rhino and I'm just gonna select a single point icon. Now it's asked me where do I want that point and I'm just gonna place it for now somewhere in the middle. So I have my point here in Rhino amongst my grid of grasshopper points. So just like how I reference that surface from Rhino to grasshopper, I need to do the same thing with this point that I just drew. So I'm gonna go back to my very first tab of parameters. I'm gonna select geometry and you'll see the very first one is a point. So it's the one with the X on it. So I'm gonna select that point. And now I'm going to right click it and say set one point. And now you can see that it's the single X right here. Okay, so everyone getting comfortable or understanding the process of referencing 
geometry and right with uh, grasshopper. So again, just. So yeah, we're just gonna, again, like, so you take your point from Rhino, you can place it literally anywhere in this. Um, it's probably best just to put it somewhere amongst your grid of points. Then you go back to your very first tab of parameters, geometry, point. Again, just like how you had an orange surface component, you have an orange point component. To reference that, you wanna right click it, say set one point. And where did I draw it? Did I draw it? Did I? A little more. Right there. There you go. So yeah, just go ahead and select that. Okay. So I, I apologize. We've complicated this by adding two objects in Rhino instead of just one. But I think that's it. We'll see. Okay, so I'm gonna keep that one highlighted just so I can see where it is. So like I said, we wanna find a proximity or a distance parameter for this. So we're going to measure the distance from this point to all 2,601 points. Sounds pretty difficult, right? But it's really not. That's what's great about grasshoppers. They can pr process a huge amount of data pretty quickly. So again, I'm looking at parameters that relate to points. So I'm gonna go to my vector tab, or um, again, it's very similar to your point uh, tab. So you have vectors or points. You'll see that this fourth tab over, I have point. And then in order to do that, I'm going to select the closest point component. Don't do the closest points. It's a little bit different, um, enough to kind of ruin everything, but just select the closest point. Even though we're looking at a lot of points, we're just wanting to know the closest point. And I'll show you that even if I add more points in Rhino, we're still going to use that same exact component. So I can't, the closest points is kind of weird. I don't see a lot of value behind that one. This one's much more valuable. So select your closest point. And again, you can see it's really asking for two, like the same thing, but they're, they need to be in the correct order. So the first thing it's looking for is a point to search from. You would think that it's asking for this one, like your single point, but this one, always think of it as your pool of points, like a huge grid of points. So I'm gonna take, out of this surface divide, I can see that I got points, normals, and then UV parameters. You don't have to worry about any, either of those. We're really just worried about this one. So I'm gonna drag that into there. And here's one indication of my data starting to branch out. So like I was saying before with the curves, I'm not looking at a grid of 2,601 points all in the same data set. They're really looking at um, 51 branches of 51 points. So um, it shouldn't make a huge difference on this, but I still want to just look at all these points in the same data pool. So like I said, this is an example of starting to branch your data. In order to pull, pull it into one data, you need to right click that output. So in this case, your point, you're going to right click and then you're going to go down and say flatten. This essentially flattens that tree branch and just puts it onto all one data. So now you can see the lines even turn to a solid line. And now if I look over here, I can see that all the points are just reading in a numeric value instead of um, in a series of sets. So just make sure to do that. I It shouldn't make a difference, but we just wanna make sure it's operating correctly. 
So if you, if you keep data separated into their different branches, the data is going to only be manipulated within like each one of their sets. So you could have a universal kind of change of looking at everything, or you can have isolated transformations. In this case, we just want everything to respond the same. So that's why we flatten the branch. If a better kind of visual of that, again, you don't have to follow along, but just to help you kind of understand that, if I were to unflatten that and drag that into here, if I were to double click on this, you can see like here's 50 branches and each one of those contain a 50 points. If I were to flatten this, now it's just one branch. So. Are the branches having to do with the columns and rows? Yeah, so the way it's doing it when it's flattening, you can see, um, I don't remember the order of this, but you can see that there's, this is a way to kind of understand it. I don't know if you guys can see it well. There's sets of data. So these are like your groups of data. And then there's the data itself. So if I look at this, I can even see there's three um, decimal saying there's technically two branches because it's always a zero, zero. So there's one, two, three branches, or it's on its second branch, so to speak. So you can see there's branch one, branch two, branch three, or two, three, four, so forth and so on, all the way down to branch 50. So there's 51 because you also include zero. And you can see for each branch, there's a number of data. So n equals number, so 51 sets of information within each one of those branches. So it takes a while to kind of comprehend that. When I flatten this, so just remember, you see three um, values or three branches, or technically two. But if I right-click this, You'll now see, uh, doesn't it, if I, I have to show you in the panel here. But if I were to show you now, uh, now I just have one branch, and that's all that I have is now one branch. It's kind of like you flatten your layers in Photoshop, it's going to change everything. Exactly. You have all your yeah, that's a good comparison of doing it. Mm hmm. So yeah, in this case, we just want to be able to manipulate everything. So the next thing it's asking for is your cloud as a list. Again, like you think like cloud is like a cloud of points, right? Or a point cloud, but I only have one point here. But again, I think that's a little confusing, but you really like for the cloud of point, it's really just the single point. And here's the cool part. So now, out of my outputs, I have the closest point that it's looking at, which is just this one. You have a closest point index. You don't have to worry about that one in this case. But then you have your distance, all 2,601 in my case of distances that are just automatically figured out. And a good way to visually see how this is actually working, kind of like in the presentation I showed earlier, you don't have to follow along with this. This is just for your own kind of visual understanding of this. I'm going to go to my curve component and I'm just going to create a line that's starting at one point and going to another. So I'm going to look at all my points here and connect them with this closest point. And that's literally how it's working. It's looking at the center point here and it's looking at the it's creating a line or it's measuring that distance between that point and all those others. See how that works? So what's cool about this is, um, I'll save it for later, but that's how it's working. So uh, if I add more points, so this is a good thing to know. And uh, I don't know if I want to get into that part yet. So let's just, yeah, let's, let's not spoil any of the fun. I might go ahead and delete that for now. Okay, so here's our first step of representing data, right? We have 
a parameter now we have distance right how can we use that parameter to create geometry any takers yeah so what can we what could we create or transform Shape, color, size, yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna start off with a very simple one. Let's just create a vertical line that represents its distance between this point and this grid of points. Pretty, pretty straightforward. This is like that very kind of linear translation. So I'm gonna go over to my curve tab. So again, we, we are gonna try and create a series of vertical curves. So we know we need to go to our curve tab. I'm going to create one that operates by a distance or a length value. So just like how the surfaces work, you have an analysis tab, you have this division tab, which is a way you can divide curves into points. And then you can also do um, the primitive, which is how you create curves. In this case, I want to use my uh, Primitive tab here, and then I'm going to use my line SDL. So this is create a line segment divided by a start point, which is my grid of points. So that's their start point. A tangent. So again, this is kind of like one of those weird names. Tangent is just another name for direction. And then length. So we're going to use the distance between this point and all those points to create the length of our curve. So let's go ahead and select that and drag it down here. And so it's asking for the first thing is, if you see the icon, it's looking for a point. So the start point, that's our grid. So I'm going to drag that into there. If I zoom in, you can start to see that they all have a default value of one and the vertical direction. So my direction, you can see it's pointing zero, zero, one. So that's how vectors understand is a coordinate system. So if it's if it was one, zero, zero, it'd be going in the X direction. If it's zero, one, zero, it's going in the Y direction because it's just X, Y, Z. In this case, yeah, we want it to go in the Z direction. So we don't have to change anything there. But here we want, instead of it all to have one universal length, what do we want these to have a length of? The relation to the closest point. The to the closest point of that distance. So again, you have your distance value here. So let's drag that into there. And now we got this crazy looking form. Like, I don't know, that's, a little too dense to see a whole lot that's going on. So I'm just going to reduce this, my point cloud, to like something very simple. But you can see like these curves that are closest to that point are really short. And then the curves or the points that are furthest have that longest line. So like here's the coolest part. Um, is this, because this is in Grasshopper, it's not a static do you have a question? Is it? Okay. Gotcha. So in some cases, that will make a difference. This is pretty simple where it shouldn't. Um, if you were to have more points in this, if I were to look at referencing more than one point, it probably would make a difference. Um, <laughs> But it's important just to flatten it for now. Um, so here's the cool part of it all, is that if we were to change where this point is, everything should respond directly to it. So let's take, we can highlight our point in Rhino still. So we saw that showing up. And look what happens if you move it. All those lines respond directly to it. So again, it's 
Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. Um, if you go to wherever that point's being referenced and right now, and if you highlight it, it, you could probably turn this one off. You should be able to find it. Either that or reduce your point density. So this is, again, like a very quick and easy way to just show a proximity relationship. Um, do we need to take a break now or do we? Okay, so yeah, like this is really just the first step of showing again, like how you take a parameter, in this case distance, and using it to inform geometry. So let's just go ahead and take this moment to pause and reflect on our masterful model. <laughs> 